Welcome back to my video series on the dependency inversion principle. In the last video, we discussed why the dip is useful to decouple high level modules from low level modules and that dependency injection plays an important part in this scenario. We also learned that dependencies between objects should be resolved in the composition route, which usually resides directly at the beginning of your application. The composition route that we created in the last video uses a technique called pure DI, which means that we create and plug all necessary objects together with our own statements. This technique was formerly also known as poor man's DI. But I think you can easily imagine that composition routes can become quite large when you write more complex pieces of software. In these cases, it is often more useful to utilize so-called dependency injection containers, or DI containers in short. So let's check out what a DI container actually is. For this video, I'm going to use a DI container called Light Inject. There is a vast variety of free DI containers available for .NET, like for example Microsoft Unity, Castle Windsor, Ninject, or Structure Map. It's hard to name them all, but Light Inject is my personal favorite and that's why I'm going to use it here. Right now, you can see that I'm downloading the necessary assemblies via the NuGet Package Manager console. So let's start transforming our composition route to use a DI container. The corresponding class in Light Inject is called Service Container. After I created a new instance of it, I have to let the DI container know which concrete types should be used for abstraction types. This is done via the register method, where I specify the abstraction and the concrete type using c -sharp generics. Here you can see that if an iReader is requested, the DI container should try to instantiate a console reader. The same goes for the iWriter abstraction. Finally, I just have to register the copy process class to the DI container and afterwards I can call get instance on it to obtain an instance of that class. This is where the actual magic of a DI container happens, because it now tries to recursively run through the types of the object graph to be created and inject all the necessary dependencies. So let's reconstruct what happens internally when get instance of copy process is called. Initially, the DI container looks at the class copy process via reflection and finds that it has one constructor. This constructor must be called by the DI container to create an instance of copy process. So the next step is to have a look at the parameters of this method. The constructor requires an iReader and an iWriter instance. So the following thing is to look up the mappings that were provided to the DI container. Here it sees that if it should resolve an iReader instance, it should use the console reader class. So again, it takes a look at the constructor of this class, seeing that it just has a default constructor. The DI container then calls this constructor to obtain an instance of console reader and passes this object as the first parameter to the copy process constructor later on. Then the DI container does the same thing for the iWriter interface. And this basically shows how a DI container recursively runs through all the types necessary and then instantiates the corresponding objects and connects them from the bottom up. This is the basic functionality that every DI container provides. Thus, you do not instantiate all objects by yourself like you did with pure DI, but you provide mappings from abstractions to concrete classes that the DI container uses when resolving complex object graphs. Afterwards, you just call getInstance for the highest level module that you need to run your program and the DI container will create the corresponding object graph for you. Aside from this basic functionality, DI containers offer advanced features like for example interception and lifetime management. While we won't discuss the former in this video, we will have a look at the latter because this allows us to easily manage the lifetime of objects created by the DI container. I'm sure you remember that we had to call this pose after the copy function when we injected a file writer. This cleanup management can be done by the DI container if you register your types in a special way. By default, LightInject does not keep track of objects that it created which is called a transient lifetime mode. 
But we can register the file writer class with a different mode called per request lifetime, which tells the container to also keep references to objects that it created from this very class. In this register statement, you can also see that I passed in a Lambda expression that creates a new file writer manually because I do not want to register the file path with the DI container. If you register one or more services with such a lifetime mode, you have to call get instance within a service container scope so that the DI container knows how long it should keep track of the objects. This scope is started by the service container dot begin scope method. It returns an I disposable. When you dispose of this object, the scope ends, and this can be done easily with a using statement in C sharp that calls dispose automatically when the closing braces are reached at runtime. When the scope is disposed, all I disposable objects that the container keeps track of are disposed too, as you can see in this debug run. As you now know how you can register a class with a certain lifetime, let's have a look at the different modes that come with Light Inject. The default mode is transient. This means the container creates an object of this class every time it is resolved. The container will not maintain a reference to the created objects in this mode, so they will not be disposed of. Another mode we already got in touch with is per request. Here the container also creates a new instance every time the corresponding class is resolved. But in contrast to the transient mode, it keeps references to the created objects. That's why it's not allowed to call getInstance outside of a container scope. The next mode I want to discuss is called perContainer. Essentially, this is a singleton because when a class that was registered with this mode is resolved, the container just creates a single instance of it and reuses it for every request. The container will also dispose of the singleton object, just not at the end of a container scope, but when the container itself is disposed. And the last mode that ships with Light Inject is the per scope lifetime. It works just like the per container lifetime, but only within a container scope. That means that the same instance is injected by the container within the same scope, but when the scope ends, the object is disposed of and a new one is created if you start a new scope. So these are the different lifetimes you can use to register your classes to the container and you will find similar ones in other DI container frameworks. If you want to learn even more about dependency injection, I would encourage you to read Mark Seaman's excellent book Dependency Injection in .NET. Also, check out his blog where he posts regularly. You can find the link in the descriptions below. I hope you got a better understanding what a DI container is in this video and I hope to see you again in the next one. Bye!